that the facts that they present here are not unique to crisis call center people, but they're also very common to mental health workers, which is sad. But let's look at some of these sad statistics here for a moment. Um, evaluations of crisis hotline processes and outcomes. Here's a research study conducted by Mishera at, uh, et al. Uh, that is, a, that there was a group of other researchers with him who studied <coughs> silently monitoring 1,000 431 calls to 14 centers. That might happen to you one day. I don't know. Are, are calls monitored? They might be. Okay. Well, this was for the purpose of research. They selected 14 call centers and they took 1,431 calls and what they discovered was that, first of all, in about half of those cases, 723 cases, the person was not even asked about suicide. 474 of those who were asked and reported that they had suicidal thoughts, no question about how they might do it or the means were asked. In other words, the caller didn't explore the issue a little bit further. In 159 of those incident, incidences, um, only um, or uh, when the helper was aware that the caller was considering suicide and had, and had determined a means to use, the helper only asked 30% of the time if a suicide was actually in progress. It's difficult to remember all this, and I know that, but you know, experience will be a good teacher for you as well. What you'll have here is some tools, and you'll have some good information to hold on to and refer, and refer back to as, as we go through this. But it's important to answer, I mean, to ask all those questions. Listen to something that they that they said, these researchers uh, said, uh, it says in the top paragraph there that crisis hotlines are in a unique position to intervene when individuals are at various uh, points along the pathway to suicidal behavior, including the moment <coughs> prior to that fateful decision. This special contribution to suicide prevention is undermined, however, if staff members are unwilling or reluctant to persistently inquire about and explore suicidal thoughts, feelings with the caller. Your role is important in talking about suicide. This is very important. Um, contact called me one night, I think it was probably about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Picked up the phone and um, they said, Bill, we've got um, somebody that is, is talking about ending it all. Uh, we've tried to talk to them for a while. Uh, they've not calmed down. They're still bent on, on doing this. Would you give them a call? And I said, sure. And I called and I talked to the person. It was someone who I had known from my clinical practice in the, in the past. Uh, someone that I knew to be impulsive and to, and to um, have a history of doing things like this. And as I was going through this process of talking to him about his desire for suicide, his uh, intent, his capability, he was answering all of those. And I said, uh, and, and what are you doing now? And he said, I'm actually taking the pills right now. Pretty scary. Right? But what would have happened had I not pursued that with him, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, if he chose not to be, if, because I didn't ask, and, uh, it, it's possible that he may be dead today. As it were, I was able to keep him on one phone, uh, cell phone, use my home phone to call 911, uh, get some rescue people out there. We got him to the hospital, got his stomach pumped, and he survived. And uh, 
Today he's very grateful for that, for that, uh, for that night. So we never know. Um, I'm glad that this doesn't happen a lot, but we have to talk about it. Um, we have to talk about it. How many of you uh, have ever been skydiving? One. How many of you would like to skydive? Okay. No one raised their hands. Not even the one person who went skydiving. I'd like to skydive. Though. Yeah, I would. Yeah, sure. Would you do it again? Yeah, well, you and I would go. My sister did. Did she? <laughs> but let's suppose let's suppose none of us really had any interest in skydiving, and uh, I were to talk to you about uh, skydiving. Do you have thoughts about skydiving? And you say, no, I, I don't even really have any desire for it. Uh, do you intend to do that any time? Uh, and you say, no, I never intend to jump out of an airplane. You, you have to be mad. You have to be crazy. So you've not formulated any plans? No. Uh, don't even have the means. Uh, I, I wouldn't even have the, the dollars that it took to get up in the, in the plane, and I had no desire or intent or plan. But in talking about skydiving, how many of you now plan to go out and skydive tomorrow? No, no. You know, talking about suicide is not going to increase the likelihood of someone actually committing the act. Um, if you will. If you'll turn the page, and let me get some of my pages out of here because I've inserted some others that don't need to be here. Uh, if, if you'll turn um, the page, and on page four, the bottom there, uh, number E, it says, Be assured that persistent assessment of call of suicidal ideations and inhibitions reduces the distress. Be assured that persistent assessment of a caller's suicidal thoughts, what are inhibitors? What does that mean? Things oh. that hold them back? Yeah, the things that hold them back from wanting to do it. So your persistent discussion about their thoughts about suicide, and as well as the things that are holding them back, they're going to be calling those buffers here later on in our, in our training, actually reduces stress. Um, in the adjoining column, these, uh, these writers state, it's essential that every caller be assessed for suicide risk. A common misperception or misconception is that asking about suicide might aggravate or upset callers, or plant the idea in a person's mind. Research indicates, however, that the opposite is true. We must be comfortable enough, therefore, with the topic to weave the risk assessment into the course of the call while maintaining rapport with the, client, with the callers uh, with whom there is less control than in face-to-face -face visits, right? How much control do you have when you're on the phone? Can you see what's going on? All you have is a voice and maybe some tone, you know, uh, on the other end of the line. So it's important to weave in a discussion of suicide as you're building rapport with that person, um, which is also very important, and you learn about that as well in, in, the, in the books that, that you have. Uh, under a um, section, I believe, entitled Empathy. Well, what are the four domains that are important to talk about? Page 7. The, uh, the first one is, is suicidal desire. Research to date does indeed indicate that suicidality is a multifaceted <coughs> phenomenon. But the research has included that it includes three primary domains. And so you want to be thinking about these three primary domains as you ask questions. Suicide desire, uh, capability, and intent. You know, we, and I'll reverse that order sometimes, but desire I usually put first, capability, and then intent. And then the fourth one, buffers. But what is suicide desire? If, um, if somebody picks up the telephone and they say, you know what, 
I just don't care to live anymore. That's kind of a statement of suicidal desire, isn't it? Um, in my practice, I refer to these things as death wishing, you know. And I'll say to people sometimes, you know, uh, as a way of leading into a discussion about suicide, Joe or Jane, uh, you know, has there ever been a time in your life when you felt like, you know, if I didn't wake up in the morning, that would be okay with me? Or, you know, if my life ended today, that would be okay with me? And if they say yes, what are you looking at there? You're looking at suicidal desire. People that get into uh, bouts of major depression will frequently find themselves there, or can, it's common for them to find themselves there. I just don't care to live anymore. Um, they may express, uh, flat out express, a wish to die, I want to die. I don't care about carrying on. Um, or uh, maybe they have made passive attempts uh, in the past. I spoke with uh, someone recently about, um, about their suicidal thoughts, and you always have to clarify what people mean by that. Um, but she said that she had been having suicidal thoughts, and, and I said, can you, can you tell me a little bit more about what kind of thoughts you've been having? And uh, she didn't quite know how to answer that, and so uh, I suggested some other things. I said, well, you know, have you ever, for instance, thought that if I wasn't here, you know, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, that'd be okay with me, or if the Lord took me today, that'd be all right? Yes, she said, and she was able to identify with that. Um, and she went on to say how that the day prior she had actually picked up a knife and uh, was thinking about cutting herself with that. And so that moves into um, another realm, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Into capability, right? Mm -hmm. There's a knife. Uh, but the, the desire, the death wishing, the desire uh, was, was certainly there. Um, in their research, they, they found that there were, that there were two um, primary things that might make someone feel this way. One of them was a perceived burden on other people. And uh, I want you to underline that because there is, there is other research that, that is not listed here which indicates that when perceived burdensomeness plus a sense of ineffectiveness in one's life are combined, suicide risk is very high. And so you might just write that in the, in the, in, in the side. Uh, beside perceived burdensomeness, um, a sense of ineffectiveness. And what do I mean by a sense of, of ineffectiveness? Um, you know, someone who feels as though um, they have no control or power or influence um, in their life. They just feel very ineffective. Um, they're, not, they're not good at making friends. They're not good at communicating. Um, they're, they're not, you know, uh, there's a sense of ineffectiveness. But, but here, the sense of burdensomeness you will hear a lot, uh, or from time to time. I hear it a lot in, in my practice. That, um, you know, I just feel like, um, you know, if I wasn't here, it would be a lot easier for everyone else, or they, they would be a lot better off. And uh, there's, there's a problem with that kind of thinking. Can you think of what, a pro what, what one potential problem with that kind of thinking might be? How would you respond to somebody who said to you, you know, well, I just feel like if I wasn't here, that everyone else would be better off? Can you think of a how you might respond to that? You could leave all these people having to deal with it. That's exactly right. You know, um, you have to consider the impact that it might have on others. One of the things that is true about people who actually get to the point where they're thinking about suicide, and, and it'll come up here in this in this uh, literature and this research as well, is that they're not thinking clearly. They, uh, they're, they're in a state of distress, um, and they 
honestly cannot find or see solutions. And so your role is very important. You can suggest some possible solutions. Oh, really? Do you have do you have a daughter or do you have a son? How do you think it would impact them? You know, do you really think that your mom or your dad would would really have a heyday and, and throw a party if you killed yourself? I mean, do you really believe that? I know it seems that way, um, but um, you know it's really not. And um, and by the way, in, when you're talking with someone who's at that point, cancel. Um, I don't know what I did, but I, uh, I I've lost my my uh, LifePoint website. You can take them to that website page and over to those little cartoon figures that I was showing you about. You know, if they have a computer, and uh, you know, you can tell them to kind of look through some of those stories, a little short vignettes, or short stories about how suicide really uh, impacts the life of others. You know, uh, and family members. Um, Families have a tremendous time dealing with suicide in their family. One of the reasons why is there's, there's a sense of embarrassment about it. There's a sense of shame sometimes in families, um, you know, because um, suicide is perceived by many as weakness. It's perceived as, um, you know, something other than perhaps what it really was. Um, then where was the family? Why didn't somebody do something? Yeah, and there's a lot of guilt that, that comes along with it. And, and these families will live with that for, for years. So um, you'll, you'll frequently find perceived burdens in this. Then, then secondly, and we, we touched on this a little bit, is feeling trapped. Uh, the sense of dealing with some psychological pain. What do, I, what do I mean by that? Emotional pain. Emotional pain. Depression. Severe anxiety. And by the way, uh, suicide risk is also very high with severe anxiety, so don't don't think it's just depression. Don't make don't fall into that trap or that mistake. If I'm so anxious, and by the way, if you stay in this field long enough, you'll talk to people who will not come out of their house. They'll not come in to Piedmont Community Services to see someone, to talk to someone, or go to their doctor to get a doctor's appointment to get some medication, but they'll call you and they'll drive you crazy because they won't come in because they're so anxious about perhaps leaving their home environment or they're so scared uh, you know, about a lot of unrealistic things um, they feel trapped and uh, that can be a, a high risk situation and, and you may hear them say things like you know what I just wish I wasn't here okay. but um, death wishing is common but when you, when you see it paired with perceived burdenness, feeling trapped, or what I call is, you know, a sense of a lack of um, effectiveness in relationships, um, you know, the ante is, is, has, has increased a little bit. But desire by itself is not sufficient for someone to actually complete an act. Of suicide. Let's look at let's look at a second component or a second domain, suicide capability. And what I would like for you to do, you'll notice that in that top sentence, there's a word in that line that says um, fearfulness. You need to change that to fearlessness. That's a typing error on my part. It says components of suicidal capability include number one. A sense of fearlessness to make an attempt. A sense of competence to make an attempt. The availability of the means and the opportunity for the attempt. A specific plan or, prepar or preparations. All of those constitute a person's capability. Um, Another woman who I, I spoke with several years ago, I can recall, who um, knew that a loved one of hers was also dealing with a terminal illness, stated that when, when he dies, I'm going to end my life. I'm not going to be able to survive it. I'm, I'm going to I'm end my life. That's, that 
moves beyond a desire. That moves more into the planning stage, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When he dies, I'm going to. When he dies. Okay. Um, I've heard that. How about this sense of fearlessness? Where does that come from? A sense of fearlessness to, to harm oneself. Well, it can come from a variety of sources and places. It can come from um, uh, learn, a learned curve. You will find, for instance, uh, that uh, cutters, and you'll hear people say that, that cutting is not suicidal behavior, and by definition, cutting or burning or tattooing or body piercings, uh, etc., are not, um, are not um, um, suicide attempts, uh, but research bears out that those who have a history of inflicting pain on themselves can become fearless in time. They desensitize themselves because they've been through the pain. They know what it's like. They've been there before. And frequently, uh, and, and, you know, when you're talking with people who are cutters, for example, um, you know, you can ask them, you know, um, about how deep they cut the last time, you know. Uh, you know did, it, did you cut deep enough to require a band-aid? Deep enough to require stitches? Deep enough to require staples? I've seen them. I've seen them. Saw a fellow in the ER who had cut his arm from the elbow down. And by the way, if they're cutting this way, that's the most dangerous way to cut. A lot of people will cut across. Don't educate people on that, by the way. But he had, he had done it right and required something like 46 to 56 staples. Not, not stitches, but staples to bring himself back together again because the cut was over a quarter of an inch deep. There's a difference, and, and people that uh, have a history of doing this sort of thing, uh, where I was going with this, are really, they really are at higher risk, in a higher risk category than those who have not desensitized themselves to pain. Um, they have, in a sense, a sense of competence to make that attempt. They feel like they're able to do it for whatever reason. You always want to check for the availability of means. Always want to check for that when you're talking to someone. You get that telephone call and someone is really upset, they're crying, and you're asking them what's wrong and how can I help you, and they're telling you about some real serious problem in their life or some serious stressor that's going on in their life and that they're thinking about ending it all, well, you don't have to ask them at that point do you have a desire because they've just said it, right? So you know desire is there. And you move into this area of capability and you ask them questions, you know, around, um, you know, this idea of, you know, have you thought about a plan and how you might do that? Uh, and they say, well, I have a whole bottle or a, 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 a medicine cabinet full of medication I was thinking about taking. Well, there you have the availability or the means to do that. And what do you want to do as a caller if, if they tell you that they have the means and, and the means are available? It could be medication. How else could a person in their life? A gun. A knife. Um, they might be calling you from a cell phone and standing on top of the BB and T bank and saying, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking, you know. Um, yeah. Um, but if possible, what you want to do is find out if someone else is in the home and ask them would they be willing to give the means to someone else. And a lot of times they, they will. Most of the time, actually, they actually will. Um, because they haven't gotten to the point where they intend to take their life. It's just, you know, they've had this idea. Uh, you know, if I were to do it, this is probably what I might do. And uh, uh, some people think about shooting. Actually, you'll talk, more guys will think about the more violent means of death, like shooting. Um, and and 
in most cases, women will uh, talk to you about overdosing on, on, on pain medications or something, um, or Xanax or, or something like that. Who do you suppose attempts more suicide, um, men or women? You're right. You're exactly right. More attempts are made by women uh, to, to commit suicide. Um, research also bears out that um, for that gender population, for women, uh, rates of depression are actually higher. Uh, and, and women deal with depression at earlier ages, in most cases, than men. Um, so, uh, uh, suicide attempts are more common among women. Now, these are, these are general statements when I say that uh, in, in most cases they're the... Um, um, there are you know, pills because it's not always true. There are, there are women who use other means and violent means. But generally speaking, women will, will overdose um, and, uh, and men will choose violent means. But you want to assess capability. Do they have the capability? In the second paragraph it says, it's important to note that suicidal capability factor as defined above relates to imminent plans and fearlessness about suicidality. And you might want to circle that. Imminent plans and fearlessness. Those two things are underlining. Okay. What is an imminent plan as, a, as opposed to a distant plan? What, what does that word imminent mean? Huh? Anybody? That's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's about to happen. It's, it's close at hand. It's imminent. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not this woman that I was talking to who said, when my husband dies, uh, I'm not going to live. It's, you know, I, I've been thinking about doing it now. So um, if, if someone is, is um, saying that, you know, they're really considering it, they have a plan, they thought of a plan, and, uh, and there, there's no fear at all, uh, then, um, then you're looking at some... Um, some real capability, and that raises the risk. And uh, I'm going to show you a, um, a sheet here. If I had known that we had this, I could have brought a transparency, but, but that's okay. Um, you'll be, um, actually, go to the back of your packet and pull out a piece of paper that looks like this. It's got the three squares with the circles on it. And you will notice there um, in the bottom block, it says moderate to low risk. In the middle block, moderate to high risk. And in the top block, you're dealing with someone with high risk. Well, let's look at the bottom block, first of all. What does D stand for? Desire. Desire. C? Intent. Capability. And I, intent, right? Okay. If you just have one of those in isolation, and that's why they put a circle around each one. If you're just dealing with one of those, you're dealing with low to moderate risk. However, if someone has a desire, the middle block, and they've also talked about intent, but not they don't have the capability, or let's say they, they have a desire and they, you've talked about capability and they have the capability and the means, but they don't have the intent. They don't have all three in, in combination. You're dealing with moderate to high risk. But when you find all three of them in combination, you're dealing with a very high risk case. Now, this is really not for you to be using as, as a guide to say, well, if I only have this down here, I'm not going to call... Piedmont Community Services or Emergency Services. Really, the intent of this is to show you, though, uh, that there are severity levels associated with actually completing an act uh, of suicide. Well, let's look at some of um, um, the things that constitute capability. On a back to page eight, um, a history of suicide attempt. <laughs> And you need to ask, you need to scream for that. Um, you know, have you ever attempted to harm yourself before? Um, if they say yes, you know you're dealing with a higher risk. Why? 
they've tried it before. There's that desensitization, you know, that happens. Um, I have talked to uh, uh, many people, uh, you know, uh, in, in conversations as I as I do this work day in and day out, uh, who perhaps have said, "Yeah, I ended up on the critical care unit at Memorial Hospital, and then they sent me down to one more." Right away, I know I'm dealing with a higher level there, and I want to explore that further. If there's a history of attempts, um, take that seriously. Uh, if there's a history of uh, current violence uh, toward others, a history of violence or cur current uh, violence toward others, this is a risk factor um, because they are, they are capable of inflicting injury on themselves or others. Number three is exposure. And I want to park there for a little while uh, and talk about that. Um, I will frequently ask a person in assessing for suicidality if they have ever known someone close to them um, or a family member who's actually succeeded in suicide. Um, the reason why exposure is um, a risk factor is because you will find that people, uh, especially children of parents whose, whose parents have, have, lost, uh, have lost a parent to suicide or someone really close, they tend, to grow, they tend to grow up believing that uh, or wondering if they too will one day do that. You know, Mom didn't have uh, the strength to keep herself from doing that. Will I be like my mom? Or my dad wasn't able to prevent himself from doing that. Will I do that too? And there, um, and there are probably other reasons as well. But if someone has had exposure to a, a, someone very close to them who has done that, um, uh, it, it's, it's something to consider. The, the, the risk is elevated there. We talked about the availability of means. Uh, that could be access to um, weapons, um, medications, um, bridges, whatever. Uh, current intoxication is the next one. Why is, why is being intoxicated, whether it's on alcohol or some other drug, why does that increase risk? It makes you rage. Yeah. You don't care. You know, it lowers those inhibitions that we talked about before. There's no inhibition, there's, or inhibitions are reduced. Um, um, yeah. Or if they have a tendency toward frequent intoxication. Um, on the next page, if there are symptoms of, of mental illness. Um, by the way, um, all mental illnesses can be broken down into three categories, and if you just want to um, write these on the side there, I'll, I'll tell you what they are. Depression, or depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and psychotic disorders. A psychotic disorder might be something like schizophrenia. Okay. Depressive disorders or mood disorders, anxiety disorders, um, and psychotic disorders. And um, <laughs> all of your mental health diagnoses will fall under one of those three categories. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, substance abuse. So you want to you want to assess for those things. Uh, you know, another thing: have there, you know, how long have they been feeling this way? If if this is a recent dramatic mood change, that's a risk factor because there are certain mental health conditions that can come on or or occur abruptly. Uh, bipolar and mood disorders can can uh, occur quickly, um, and uh, if a person has been um, and it's experiencing uh, a rapid decrease in their ability to function, that, that's, a, that's a, a risk factor. We talked about um, psychotic disorders being out of touch with reality. Um, and um, I don't know how many of these telephone calls you will actually get. Um, we see these more in hospital settings than perhaps you'll see on your here on television or, or telephones, but uh, people that are out of uh, touch with reality, if there's increased rage, agitation, or decreased sleep. 
Um, why do you suppose decreased sleep would be a risk factor? That fatty can feel. It really does, doesn't it? Yeah. It really does. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it lowers inhibitions again. If I'm feeling really irritable, right, um, I have less um, strength that I would otherwise have to resist an impulse, perhaps. Okay. So, so those are those are two. And uh, I was going to take a, a little bit of a break, but let's pick. Let's go through the the third one, suicidal intent, and then we'll take a quick break and come back to to buffers. How's that? And finish up finish up this um, section. And, uh, and then go on to the next one, all right? We've looked at the three, or we've looked at two of the three major categories already. Now give me some feedback. What's the first major category that you want to screen for? Desire. Is there a desire? And you want to ask about that. Have you ever thought about ending your life? Have you ever thought about suicide? What was the second one? <coughs> That's, we're going to look at intent. What? Capability. Capability. And um, what did I ask you to circle or underline? What are you really looking for in capability? Fearlessness. Fearlessness and what else? Look at your papers. What? The, means. the means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do they have the means? You know, um, and they'll tell you. By the way, if you ask them, they'll they'll tell you. Most most of the time, people will be um, uh, straightforward with you. And by the way, um, take a mental note of this. This is important. Um, what someone tells you is really almost as valid as, um, as a clinical assessment. If someone, if I'm clinically assessing someone for a risk of suicide, you know, and I spend 30 to 40 minutes doing my entire assessment or longer, okay, um, after I've done all of that, um, generally speaking, their self-report is probably going to match what my assessment ends up at anyway. So if someone tells you that they're thinking about doing it, guess what? <coughs> they probably are. Okay. So so take that seriously. All right? that, that's true. All right. Well, let's look at intent. Um, it says even more than desire or capacity, its relations to suicidality is plain. Those who intend a behavior often uh, enact it or act on it. There was some research done by Califat and his colleagues, um, and the caller's intent to die score at the end of the crisis intervention was the only significant independent predictor of suicidality following the call. Did you get that? Their intent to die score, and however they came up with that, and they may give us some more information here, their intent to die score was really the only significant independent predictor of suicidality. So if someone tells you that they intend to do something, what do you want to do? You want to believe them. You want to believe them. Just, just take it at face value and, and believe them. Um, although having made any specific plan to hurt or kill oneself prior to the call and persistent suicidal thoughts at baseline were also significant, albeit not independent predictors of any suicidality. Um, the most significant predictor of suicidality is when someone tells you they intend to do it. And you won't, you won't bump into that a whole lot. You'll talk to people who want to die, they've thought, you know, they've, they've expressed a desire, but not um, like this other person <coughs> that I was talking to on the phone who intended to do it and was actually swallowing pills while I was talking to him. But we need to assess that when we're on the phone. Is there a plan or attempt in progress? You know, um, do you have a plan to hurt yourself? You want to ask about that. Because these represent some of the most dangerous aspects of suicidality, if there's a plan. Um, I was talking to uh, another person, and she was really reluctant 
to tell me about her plan. She said that she had a plan, but she didn't want to tell me. Um, and although I pressed the issue some, I also spent more time talking to her, building some more rapport, um, building trust, and you'll, you'll have to do that on the phone. You know, you don't, sometimes you can't always just drive to the point and, and get the information you look at. Sometimes you've got to back away from that, talk about some other things, come back to it a little bit. She didn't want to give up her plan. Why? Because once she told me, um, then she'd have to think of another plan. But um, as it turned out, she had um, a handgun that had belonged to her husband that went missing five years prior. Her husband had no idea what happened to it, and she told him she didn't know what happened to it either. But she had taken it out to their family cabin and hid it underneath the porch just in case that day came when she was actually ready to do it. Um, that's intent. That's intent. It may not be imminent, but that was intent. Um, and she, she didn't want to give that up. She eventually did. I built some trust with her. She, she told me about her plan. Uh, we contacted uh, her husband after asking her if they, I was going to do it anyway, but I always asked, you know, do you think it would be a good idea to call your husband and let you know? And, you know, we, we went through that, and uh, he went out to the cabin, and sure enough, under the front porch, the floorboards of the front porch, guess what he found? His old handgun. You know, it was there. So if there's a plan, uh, which goes into the next category, preparatory behaviors, um, preparing for suicide is not, um, is not always obvious. Um, but uh, sometimes it can be seen because a lot of times if, if uh, someone is going to kill themselves, they don't want other people to know about it a lot of times. And so, um, you know, there won't be a lot of preparatory behaviors or preparing, but there will be at times. With others you'll find that they're giving things away or selling things. I was talking to one man who uh, was reading the the uh, classifieds one day and found that his father had his entire bedroom suit up for sale and uh, talked to his father and his father said, I don't know how that got in there. And, um, and uh, unfortunately in that case, um, his father did ultimately uh, end up um, succeeding in suicide. But if you see that, that's a warning sign. People that are getting rid of stuff or giving things away, um, making plans or preparations, um, that, that will happen sometimes. And um, of course, an, an expressed intent uh, to die. Hey, let's take a break and uh, we will come back. We'll do a brief review on desire, capability, and intent, and then we'll move on to buffers. But let's take a five, 10 minute break and stretch and, and uh, then we'll come back. Uh, the last section of that or the last category this, this uh, work addresses, and that's buffers. Uh, buffers are very important when we're talking um, about suicide health and suicide prevention. What is a buffer? A buffer is, is something that stands between, isn't it? A buffer is something that stands between. A buffer can be space, psychological space, it can be physical distance, uh, it can be emotional distance, it can uh, be uh, a lot of different things, but uh, one buffer, for instance, in, in, before we just get into this, uh, take out this sheet, um, it's, it's in your packet, somewhere in the back, you'll find something that looks like this, and you have the four columns, and in the first column you see uh, examples of suicide desire, uh, in the second column, examples of suicide capability. Uh, in the third column, examples of suicide attempt. And then the buffers that we're going to be talking about. And I like to tell people that work in call centers, I use this sheet uh, myself sometimes. Used to, I don't use it as much as I used to anymore because I'm familiar with the kinds of questions to ask. But you can use this kind of as a cheat sheet as you're talking to people on, on the telephone. 
You know, do they have the desire, the capability, and the intent? If they have all three, you know, you're dealing with, with a very high risk situation. But what are some of the buffers? Well, if someone has some immediate supports, that can be a buffer. That can, that can be the thing that just kind of stands between their, um, their plan or their intent um, and uh, the actual action. Matter of fact, many people, if they feel like they're supported, if they have a sense of support by family members or significant others, um, uh, will not follow through with a, with a suicidal uh, idea. Or social supports is another one. But you are going to be talking with people on the phone, many of which will say, um, you know, when you ask, you know, do you have family or friends for support? And they'll say, no, I don't have it. And some of them won't. However, even if they say no, you need to explore that a little bit further because sometimes, again, when I'm very depressed, my, my judgment really isn't clear. Uh, I may think that I'm telling you the truth, but if, if the caller or if, if the person probes that a little bit further and says, well, you know, do you have children? Uh, yeah, I have, I have three kids. Uh, one's in the military and, and two live here in town. And, uh, you know, are you in contact with any of them? Well, I have one daughter that I talk to sometimes or something like that. Well, you know that there's some, some support, there's some social support. Um, so you need to probe that, but immediate supports are, are, are a big um, or an important buffer, uh, having some connectedness there, some social supports. Social supports can also be um, not just family and friends, but when you think of, for instance, high school students in, in, in the high school environment, who in their environment might be a support for a, for a student that you're talking to? Teachers. Teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Guidance counselors. Coaches, okay. Um, so uh, you know, think about their world a little bit as, as you're talking to them. If they're older and they're out in the, the world of work, uh, maybe they have other social supports. Are they planning for the future? That's a big one too. Do you have any future plans? Things that you'd like to accomplish in your life? <coughs> yeah, I'd like to see my kids grow up. I'd like to see my daughter walk down the aisle and get married. That's a good sign. You can build on that. Um, are they engaging with you on the telephone? And uh, this is something I think that we covered in another training that I did. But if in the process you are talking to someone who initially was very distressed, and after spending 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes, however long it takes on the telephone with them, you find that they have calmed down and, and uh, they're more uh, open with you, that's a really good sign. Uh, that's a really good sign. If, if they're engaging with you and they feel a sense of support and that you can help them in some way, um, so engagement is a big one. And I believe you'll cover that one in the training, your training as well, won't you? Uh, um, uh, ambivalence about living or dying. What do we mean by that? Um, you will find in your conversations with people uh, who have thought about ending their life, um, but then they will turn around and say, "But I would never, I, I would never do that." And you might say, "Well, you know, why?" And, and they they might say something like, "Well, because you know, um, people that kill themselves go to hell." Um, are you going to argue with that? Absolutely not. No. There's a, there's a belief there that's keeping them from actually engaging in the act. And, um, and you'll touch on that in your training as well, perhaps, at some point. What we believe as helpers um, um, is, is um, not always going to coincide with what they believe. And, and we don't always want to try and change their belief system. Okay. Do I personally believe that if someone commits suicide, they'll go to hell. Personally, I don't. And, and what you will find is that uh, over and over and over again, people will say this. You know, the Bible says. Um, but um, I can tell you that after um, uh, spending five years and getting my bachelor's degree in Bible college and spending some time in the ministry even, uh, and studying my Bible uh, over the last several couple, actually a couple decades, 
I have never found a single statement anywhere in the Bible that says if a person kills themselves, they're going to go to hell. But I'm not, am I going to argue with somebody about that? No, no. So if there's some ambivalence about doing this because, you know, hey, I just don't know how things are going to end up, no, you, you know, that, that's a good sign. Uh, core beliefs and values, uh, people might have other values or beliefs as well. One that you'll hear uh, a lot is, you know, I couldn't do that to my kids. You know, there's a value there. There's a, um, you know, I value my relationship with my kids. And having kids is also a buffer. It's, it's not on here, but it's a buffer. If someone has children, um, that can be a buffer. And then finally having a sense of purpose. This just gives you four categories. It doesn't tell you all the questions to ask. It gives you four general broad categories um, that you need to be very aware of. Uh, when you're dealing with people on um, the telephone regarding suicide. First of all, don't be afraid to ask the questions. You have to talk about it. And by talking about it, you will lower their anxiety uh, and, their, and you'll increase their ability to deal with it. They're happy that somebody's actually talking about how they feel. They've not been able to tell anybody else, maybe but you. You will decrease their anxiety. Talk about it. You'll decrease the risk of suicide. Talk about it. Um, you know, check out whether they have the desire. Find out if the capability is there, the means, and find out if they've ever had an attempt. Before I close out this section, I have just included this in your packet. It's just something that I typed up myself, and I frequently, if I'm with someone in, in counseling or in the emergency room, and I have one of these with me, I will give this to the person because um, in the top block it gives um, uh, some ideas for developing a safety plan. Uh, and this too comes from that website that we, that we looked at. Uh, uh, none of this material is mine. Um, it, it comes from that website. But then down below it gives people some other resources. There's uh, telephone contacts and you'll find your the number to contact on there as well, <coughs> on community services. There are internet sites, uh, one of which we pulled up tonight, and then other walk-in services that, that people can be uh, made aware of. Thank you for the opportunity today and sharing with you uh, the, the three major categories um, that you need to be mindful of when you're talking about suicide prevention, and then the one buffer, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.